insight. And so before we get started and before I invite our panelists to introduce themselves, I just want to make a couple of housekeeping notes. We do have um, ASL interpreters here with us today. Um, you can see them hopefully on your screen. Um, if you need additional assistance, we also have closed caption options as well at the bottom um, turned on. Um, please send a message to either myself, um, Alexis or Kelsey if you have any additional um, Zoom needs um, or access needs. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself. So welcome, my name is Dr. Ashley Grice. I'm the director of the Pride Resource Center here at Colorado State University. And it is a great honor to host our third annual uh, Pride at Work panel um, co in collaboration with our Career Center here on campus. And so this is a great opportunity for our campus community um, as well as uh, community members um, outside of Fort Collins and our uh, communities um, all across the, uh, the globe to engage um, in some professional uh, conversations um, uh, for whatever folks have goals for in the future. So um, with that, I am going to um, invite, so we have five panelists, um, Michaela, Maxine, Morris, Ark, and Dan. Um, I'm gonna invite them to introduce themselves and then we're just gonna go ahead and jump right into some questions that we have to get our panel going. So um, Morris, do you wanna actually start us off? Good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. Morris Price. He is him pronouns. Um, class of 19, I say 1985, um, math modules say class of 1987. We'll forever disagree about that. Um, Denver native, um, graduated from Colorado State University with a degree in communications. Um, real quick, spent 15 years in higher education. Thank you, Blanche Hughes, my mentor. Uh, 10 years in uh, philanthropy, working for the Daniels Fund, the Conservative Foundation, and then the Gill Foundation, uh, LGBT funder. Um, then I became chief of staff for a congresswoman, five years running a nonprofit, and now I'm vice president of grants for the Colorado Trust. We fund health equity through a racial equity lens. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Morris. Uh, Michaela, you want to jump in next? Uh, yes, absolutely. Also, my apologies to anyone who may hear any background noise. I'm currently taking this call for my car. Um, which I can explain a little bit more later, but I'm Michaela, right? I use they, them pronouns, um, and I am coming from Seattle. I am a social worker um, with an MSW and um, a licensed uh, clinical social worker in Washington. I also work with public health um, around the well-being of youth and their communities and really responding to COVID. Um, in addition, I got my bachelor's degree from Smith College and my master's degree from Case Western Reserve University. So not from Colorado, not a local, but I did grow up um, in a neighboring state um, in Kansas. Um, and so it's nice to see everyone. And I think that's um, just a little about me and I can share more later. Thank you so much. Also just make note, we're we'll try and put the questions in the chat as well um, as we go through um, the rest of our introductions. Uh, Maxine. Go on. Uh, Maxine Cofino. I'm originally from uh, Puerto Rico. I uh, went to Colorado State, class of 2010. I have a bachelor's degree in political science, and now I'm the co-owner with my wife of the Lemon Girls, a uh, beverage uh, farm stand that we own, and then we are, uh, just started a new farmer's market here in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Arcus. Hello everyone, my name is Arcus. I use Z or they pronouns. I'm from Colorado. I am early in my career. My background is in electrical engineering and I worked for AMD and now for Intel in Portland, Oregon. Um, as far as LGBTQ advocacy goes, I am a volunteer crisis responder for Thrive Lifeline, which is a trans owned mental health lifeline that people can text at any time. Awesome, and Dan. Thank you. I'm Dan Willis, uh, he, him, pronouns. Uh, I live in Westminster. I am a Colorado State grad, 1985, with a degree in history, uh, social studies teaching certification, and then a master's in education, uh, administration, and communications in 1989. Um, I am uh, enjoying the good life now. September of 21, I retired after 20 years with IBM. Um, that's why Morris has a tie and I don't. So uh, 
<laughs> I, uh, I started my career in sports information. I was in athletics at Colorado State and then uh, moved around the country at various jobs. I did that for 10 years. Uh, went on from that to uh, PR agency work, uh, working for a Denver high-tech PR firm and a New York City-based firm before joining IBM for 20 years. Um, I am married. My husband, Max, and I have two grown children and two very spoiled dogs, and we live in Westminster. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for engaging and introducing yourself. Sounds like we got a breadth of experience here, so definitely looking forward to uh, hearing more about your, your experiences and your journey um, professionally. So first question officially we're going to ask is, how do your identities show up um, or not show up when you're at work? And I'll let whoever wants to jump in first to, to answer. I guess I can go ahead and answer. Um, I feel like I'm thinking out loud, so my apologies, everyone, if I just seem like I'm rambling in a stream of consciousness. Um, but to answer that question about how my identity show up at work, I would say um, they always have. So I identify as non-binary, um, trans, and um, I am queer. Um, as soon as I came out, honestly, I told my coworkers, and so I remember um, right after I had graduated from undergrad and I had moved back to Kansas for a little bit to work uh, at a residential facility for young people. And um, we were doing this identity stacking. And so they asked like who identifies as LGBTQ and I like raised my hand and I remember someone coming up and be like, wow, you're so brave for, for saying that um, in public. And I didn't understand that comment at the time. Um, and I still think about it a lot. Like, what does it mean like to say that I'm brave just by saying that I am who I am? Um, but that moment was helpful. And I, I think about how often people might have fear and it's okay if you don't feel comfortable sharing your identity at work. But um, I feel like from day one, I've always been very transparent and I've always led with that identity. I mean, I've done that intentionally because there are very few people with my identity who work in the field I work in. Um, even now with public health, part of the reason why, I, and a big part of uh, my identity with this work, they mentioned that they deeply appreciated the fact that I am someone who is part of the Black LGBT community and that I do identify as non-binary and um, just the need that we see in LGBTQ populations around uh, mental health support and people with shared identities to them. So by virtue of me being out and open, I've been able to move into this work where I'm now supporting LGBTQ youth across the county um, in addition to their peers. And even before that, being able to work with um, the Washington Black Trans Task Force to really influence and support Black trans folks across um, the state um, and to really be able to provide um, like mental health supports, like through self-care groups and mindfulness groups and all these other things. Um, my identity actually is a big part of why I decided to become a therapist because I, I remember looking for a therapist myself and I could not find any Black queer therapist. And I was like, this is an issue. <laughs> we have to figure this out. Um, and so I decided to just go and do it myself and to become a therapist and to become a mental health professional. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And um, I'm grateful that I get to work with uh, my communities and I can openly say like, yeah, no, this is who I am and these are my pronouns. Um, and I know that's not a safe decision for everyone, but I do think there's so much reward in being able to lead with honesty and to say, this is who you are, um, and to be able to go to places that celebrate you for that and support your identity and support your community as well. So that's my answer. Um, yeah. Thank you for that, Michaela. I, Dr. Ash, I'll go second, because I think mine is through phases, similar, not similar to, I gotta, so I came out uh, my freshman year at CSU. Um, and at that time, the GLBT meeting, you had to call, leave your name and room number so they could call and give you the code and number where the meeting was. It wasn't public. And so coming out was at the time a little, it felt more scary because you wonder why it had to be so protected. But I was fortunate that my friends around me accepted me. Um, I was one of the founding members of the first black fraternity on campus and I was out um, in that position. Um, I was president of the foundation, I mean, of the fraternity, and uh, people asked me, did, you, did it bother your brothers? I said, they didn't like it, they could just quit, and they'd rather have a gay president than take the position themselves. That's how bad that they didn't want to be president of the chapter. Um, but I stayed involved in both. Um, 
Congress of African American Students then. I was president of that while president of the fraternity. So I would tell myself that through college, I was strategically but cautiously um, out because this was not the time in 1985 when you were can just say you were out. There were no protections. Um, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of the laws weren't on your side. Um, I left to my first career was college admissions for an all-male college in Indiana, a small town of uh, 16,000. And I remember driving through the cornfields of Indiana in August of 1986 thinking, what the hell are you thinking? You are a 26-year-old gay Black man in a Hyundai driving to Crawfordsville, Indiana. The worst case scenario never happened. I get there and identify, I find some openly gay professors who embrace me. I found gay students at all-male college who needed to find someone like themselves. And so for a second phase was, I was out personally. I wasn't making a point of being out professionally. It didn't seem to really be a need. Um, my, my career was advancing. Moved to New York, moved back to Indiana, and that's when I came out professionally. I was asked to put on the, we started the first um, Gay and Lesbian Association for National Association of College Admission Counselors. And for some reason, doing that publicly was so different, although I'd been out to my family and my friends, um, but being professionally and found again that most embraced it. It never, I never saw it as a hindrance. Someone tried to use it once politically on campus to position in a certain way and the campus kicked back. And that's when I found you have allies where you don't always expect it. There's some people who just fundamentally believe in, 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 the, uh, um, in the rights. And that was of course right when the first March on Washington happened. So went to that, boom, all of a sudden you realize this is not just me, this is a movement. Um, didn't know what your role would be, but you realize the scale of people, not big parties, circuit parties, but people there for the purpose of advocacy. So it becomes a whole different work. Moved home in 1996, become Dean of Admissions at DU. And from that point on, I've always been open and out. Um, negotiated from a point of, I have a partner. If you want me, here's what we, we would have to have. I was out to my parents, out to my minister, out to my boss at that point. There was really nothing holding me back. Um, and then became involved heavily with Gay and Lesbian Community Center. I was chair of the board. Um, hosted a number of different organizations. So it hasn't hurt me, but I will tell myself that it was a different age and time then. Um, and so that you took a risk. There were no protections at the time. You could have walked to the boss. He just said, I don't see a picture of a woman on your desk. I think you're gay. And that was enough to get you fired. So I'm appreciative of the work that folks did before me that they don't have to worry about some of those things, but be cautious because if someone wants to use it against you, they statistically still can. Thank you so much, Morris. That I just want to take a moment and like, folks, I hope y'all appreciate the historical knowledge uh, in the space right now um, shared through that experience. That's, it's, that's deep. Um, and we appreciate you sharing that with us for sure. Anyone else want to jump in and answer, answer the, this question for us? I can jump in. Um, I was a, a similar timing as Morris, as far as being at CSU. Uh, undergrad, I finished in 85. Um, I was, as opposed to Morris, I would call myself a late bloomer. I did not have any self-realization until I was in my mid thirties. Uh, so I did not come out really until probably early 2000s. Um, at that point, I had gone through uh, 10 years of college athletics. Those of you who have been involved in it know that that world has certainly evolved. Um, I was fortunate in most of my sports information work and, and being um, at different conferences and different schools with, with uh, women's athletics because I found that to be more open, more welcoming. Um, I went from that to the PR agency world where they really did not care, you know, any background. That it, as long as you produced, you were who you were. And I was fortunate there with both agencies, especially one being based in New York City, obviously a lot more diverse. And then uh, my final step for the last 20 years at IBM, I am extremely thankful to land at a, at a corporation that was global, that was diverse, that was welcoming. Um, that is when I was actually able to come out. And so for my last, what, 18 years there, I was who I was. You know, I had my family, I had my kids, I could talk to you in meetings about what you did over the weekend, what I did, what my kids are doing, what your kids are doing, and be who I am, meet my husband, you know, everything. And I think that as far as coming from um, the early 80s and seeing how things evolved from that point through to a global corporation where diversity 
and actually being LGBT was viewed as a strength. I mean, you brought a lot to the table as far as diversity and leadership and openness. I mean, I think I actually viewed it as a major strength in that there's, you carry no judgment. Um, I worked on teams, there might be 10 of us on a call and I'll tell you from a different country. So you were actually more concerned about cultural norms and, and being you know, proper than you are about if you were gay or not. So I think um, that's probably my biggest, my biggest takeaway from my final position. And really what I'm most thankful for was being with a corporation that not only supported, but provided opportunities and promoted diversity. Thank you so much, Dan. And Dan, did you say you, you retired? I retired uh, September of last year, yep. Congratulations. Thank and I you. think that's, that's so important for us to also just name in the space as well, to see that it's possible to live a, a full life um, in who you are and your identities and, and, and retire um, and, and be, be able to see that that's a possibility for our community. So thank you so much for being here and sharing that part of your story. Um, Marcus or Maxine, either of you wanna jump in here? Yes, um, so I started and my first job out of university was as a probation case manager and it's a very male dominated field and I was apprehensive because one of the type of social interactions I would have with clients, people on probation and then the coworkers, how that would play out in terms of how they viewed me in terms of office dynamics. Um, at the first test, I, I, I did not hesitate. I very clearly am out. I've been out since high school. And so uh, it was welcoming. I didn't have much of you know, bad experiences. And as I moved up in different governmental uh, roles, um, I did not have a, a bad experience coming out, although I did have issues with my female identity in managerial roles, uh, much more effectively than anything about being a lesbian. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead, Argus. So as far as my identity coming to work, that's something that um, I related to what Michaela said as far as I lead with that. That's something that I really want to name in this, in this, when I enter a new space and make sure it is honored going forward. And that wasn't always the case. Um, I came out in college and it was very important to me to be out at my school because I wasn't out to much of my family at the time. Um, I now am and that is not a supportive space for me. So I found a lot of power in being out professionally because it was a space where I could say, look, this is my career. I'm going to make strides and this isn't going to hold me back, especially since in other areas of my life, I did not have that support system. So if anyone is considering their coming out in the workplace, I would consider who do you have that supports you at work, outside of work? Where can you get that energy and support from? One thing that's been very enriching about being out in the workplace is plenty of people who aren't out, but who are part of the LGBTQ community will come to me with their frustrations, their identities, um, and seeking advice. And I did not realize how many invisible LGBTQ people were around me as a part of the community just because especially in tech and we heard many other fields as well, just don't have a lot of queer people. And that compounds with um, queer people of color in the tech field especially are really silenced. And so being able to have just people who you know are like you and are in that space, it's really cool to see, but we don't have nearly enough diversity in tech. Thank you, Arcus. And so Thanks, Arcus. I realized I was still muted. Um, you, I appreciate you sharing that um, that part of your story. And you open the door for our next question, um, which is, what advice do you have about navigating disclosing um, an LGBTQIA plus identity, um, safety, privacy, um, and being your authentic self at work? So I'll take that from, um, I'm a keen on a particular part of my career. So I oversee staff of 30, um, three-fourths people of color. 
probably, as I could guess, 30% identify as queer or non-binary in some form or fashion. Um, that is a very different world. Um, I did work for an all-gay foundation. When I worked for the Gill Foundation, we were the largest funder of LGBTQ civil rights at the time. And I, although it was both the environments are so significantly different, more like because the times are different. Um, so I worked at Gill in 2005 to 2010 um, through marriage equality, from beginning to marriage equality. And it was, the big focus was creating a workspace where you could um, identify a place where you could feel safe. We were literally pushing for things like make sure, are you looking for non-discrimination statements in the employment? Are you looking deeper than just, um, I mean, there was no big presence unless some were major corporates at Pride Fest. Um, so we're an obvious place to identify queer or gay friendly companies. Um, and I think people often just trusted. Um, and in that sense, I tell folks, be cautious if you need to. That not at the point of compromising who you are, um, but your career is something you've invested in. And that to me, when it comes to playing office politics, don't trust just the trust. Remember, it's still about the work. Um, and I found one particular person became their persona became more of a performance of who their identity was as opposed to the work. They found that people resonated when they were um, acting out within their, 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 their queerness. And I knew them quietly, that was not who they were, but they felt the need to tell openly jokes. They would talk almost out of tune about their weekend, even without ask. It became almost a performance. And I was asking, why did they do that? Um, it was almost a safety shield for them. Um, it became something that was more humor. Um, and in that sense, I said, they're not really taking your life seriously. Um, and we had some difficult times with it, but it started impacting his performance at work. Um, and that became the downside. What he thought was getting him through was actually hurting him. Um, so I'm always reminding people that the, the office politics is important. Um, watch who your manager is. Identify a mentor who can give you advice on, you know, someone's gonna smile and say they, they say things about you, but ask the right person, the right time, the right thing to do things. And again, I'm a generation where you have to play cautious, but I'm also believing for those who don't, support you, they may not be blatant about it. Um, and sometimes you can falsely trust someone thinking they're supporting and then you wake up and realize that they've actually hurt your career. And uh, you've invested way too much into who you are and your education and your career to lay it on chance. Um, so I think use the tools that are out there as far as investigating the work, um, look and see if they have the HRC 100 index, anything you can to make sure the environment you're going in understands at least legally and um, culturally respects who you are. Thanks, Morris. Great stuff. I can go ahead and go. Um, I feel like I have a similar slash differing opinion. I think it gets complicated for me having grown up in Kansas, not even Kansas City, but a town outside of uh, Kansas City um, that was very conservative um, and now living in Seattle. So I've had varying experiences, basically. Um, in the city that I am from, there is no way I would be safe um, being out of my non-binary identity. But where I live currently, um, I don't have any concerns for the most part. However, um, I have had to leave jobs or not had to, but I have chosen to leave a job before and even an internship when I was um, interning as a social work student just due to uh, issues around my identity not being validated or seen and misgendering and people minimizing it. and um, saying that it didn't really matter and like all these very small microaggressive things that are not small. Um, and so I definitely agree with just being careful about who you do trust um, and what you do choose to disclose because sometimes that is weaponized against us. But the one thing I will say, and this is something that I've been embracing over the past couple of years and um, I'm very grateful and I know I'm speaking from a place of privilege in saying this, but it is okay to leave a job if you feel unsafe or if you do not feel like you are supported. Um, it is totally fine to say like, I cannot come into this place because every time I come in here, I feel uncomfortable or I am nervous or I am worried that someone is going to minimize me and make me feel small in some way or, or be disrespectful towards my community. Um, and that doesn't mean like, you know, quitting overnight and not making a good plan. Um, of course, be very strategic and make sure you're taking care of yourself because um, we all have bills that we have to pay. We all have careers that we care about. Um, and I've been lucky enough to rely on some connections that I've made um, in order to get to the next jobs that I've had. But just being able to recognize and say like, is this something I actually can tolerate? And is this a place that allows me to be myself authentically? 
um, if I'm feeling uncomfortable, like what can I do? And leaving is okay. And there are places that will celebrate us that will allow us to flourish. Thanks, Michaela. I would jump into it. I just, Michaela is exactly right. Be somewhere where you can be yourself. Be somewhere that supports you. Um, you don't have to stay. I think I was a rarity with IBM staying 20 years just because it had the right mix and it was the right fit and I was extremely fortunate. I also think um, in current conditions, it doesn't hurt to leave a job. I mean, go somewhere where they will support you and you are welcome and you can flourish. And I think that is, a, is actually viewed as a positive now as the past years where you know you were viewed as leaving your jobs too frequently or too quickly. But now it's like, no, it's opportunity. You're jumping at it. You're making a great effort. Um, and, and there's no reason why you can't be somewhere where you're accepted and supported. Just it's not acceptable not to be. Thanks, Dan. Did I, can I remind y'all how dope this panel is? Like y'all getting some knowledge drop up in this virtual space. So I just want to throw that out there. So I'm going to... Um, before I move on to the next question, I want to make sure no one else has any additional pieces of advice to add. Um, so folks who didn't get a chance to chime in, we feel good? Okay, great. So the, yes, yes, queer wisdom, queer healing, I love it. This is, yeah, this is great. I'm feeling so much joy today. Um, so our next question I want to ask is what advice, and, I, and I'm, I'm purposely asking these questions so we can center um, some of our college students who are in the space um, with us here today um, and who might have an opportunity to view this recording later on. But what advice do you have specifically for LGBTQ plus um, IA plus student, college students as they move through college um, and into their future? Um, is there anything you wish you would have known um, as you reflect back on your own experiences? May I jump in on this one? Absolutely. I went to Colorado School of Mines, um, which at least as of 2019 did not have a single paid staffer um, to assist the LGBTQ community. They do not have a gender and sexuality center. Everything is student run and student centered. Um, and we only had one LGBTQ organization on campus and that was a chapter of OSTEM. And so I got involved with that very early and that was my first real purely queer space that I was in. And it was all about protecting each other on campus. We knew the letter of Title IX better than almost anyone in the offices because we were the ones helping other students when things came up. And so that was very, very important to me to find both a community, but that led into a professional affiliation, a professional organization where I can still go to those conferences. I have many great connections. The crisis line that I work on now is from a friend who founded it and thought of me when they were assembling the crisis responder team. And so there are many great opportunities if you're able to find a professional space for LGBTQ people. I recommend finding one that is made by and for queer people. Oh, thanks, Arcus. Appreciate that. Other thoughts from other folks? I think when I was in college, I hesitated a little to join things. I hesitated because I, I doubted uh, my ability to fit into those spaces. I, I realized that I, from my standpoint of privilege, I was very straight passing. And I will, I mean, I'm, I'm not from there. I'm not from Colorado, I'm not from the United States. I'm, I speak at another language. Culturally, it was difficult to join things. I think as a, a person that felt on the outside a lot. I think I would have wanted, it's okay to join. You don't have to fit in perfectly, just do it. You have a, you want to learn about that, take the class. I, I am doing something completely different from my degree because I was afraid to do it as an undergrad and go into culinary field and go into food and go into all of this. And it's okay to not do what you study. It's okay to find your passion later in life and just Step up to the plate. I'll, I'll, I'll step in, um, and I'm hoping more people are taking advantage of this. In this space right now, you're on a place where there are people reaching out to help you. And so many students, I'll be back on campus you know, later on in, in April, and when an alum comes, I want to help, they're dead serious. 
And the number of students who are like, oh, and I know they're nervous. And I, I acknowledge that the power dynamic, sometimes the age dynamic, they're, they're nervous. But if someone is reaching out, I wish I'd have started building my network then. I was fortunate. Blanche Shoes was, and literally from my first job to now remains one of my references. Um, having someone who knows who you are authentically and can talk about your growth and having mentors at different stages of your career. Um, take advantage of every speaker if you can, every panel, every, every opportunity. Almost just go into every single opportunity because that may not benefit you right now, but it could be a huge asset down the road and who you meet. And I think students miss that. I think they think the degree alone, I'll say that the degree alone is not the dues. And we say, hey, pay your dues. That is not the dues. That gets you into the room to start paying your dues, which is when now it's about your work. Now it's about your showing up and performance. And my biggest strength came when two things happened. One, I was, it came out. Two, and I took strength finders. When I found it innately who I was as a person, in addition to who my identity was uh, as, as, a gay, as a black gay man, that combination empowered me because I recognized that I wasn't this personality. This is who innately who I was. And I let that lead me to my career. My twin sister is an engineer. She's brilliant. She just retired. My older sister is a lawyer. And I thought when I matured, I'd be that analytical person who would do sort of, that's not who I am. Strength Finder said, my number one consistently every year is woo, winning others over. And I lead with that no matter what career I go into. And I don't apologize for it. The other part is being openly gay. Go into the fray. Too often, I, I think our, our queer by now, but their folks, I won't go in the room if I'm the only person of color. I won't go in the room if I'm the only um, person identified as a woman. Go into that room. If it's a policy room, if it's a, a, a meeting of your employees, they're going to make a decision that will impact you. I'd rather have your lone voice than one that says, well, I had a gay roommate once, and I think this is what they would do. So go into the fray. You might be surprised how much they value your perspective and also, in some sense, your bravery. But to what I think in careers, we try to pull back and be so safe, we miss the opportunity to change the organization from the inside or the club or, the, or even your circle. There were five openly gay, there were five presidents of fraternities when I was there who were gay. We called ourselves the Velvet Mafia. I was the only one who was out. I was the only one who became homecoming king. So at that time, joke, joke, there were two homecoming queens, ha, ha, ha. But when I walked on that field, they didn't call me F, they called me the N-word, but I was out. So don't miss the opportunity that you will never get again on a college campus to go to speakers, panels, um, that's where some of the real networking starts. And that can carry your career for 20 years if you do it right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Other folks want to jump in? I can go ahead and go. I've just been nodding along. Like, I love everything everyone is saying. Like, I'm also giving life from this panel, <laughs> listening in from the wisdom. Um, but there's so much advice I could give undergrads. And it's and grad students as well, but it's like fresh in my mind because I, um, I guess I, I consider myself to be mid-career, but I am not that old. Um, I am looking 30 in the face. I'm not there yet, but um, just advice like networking. Don't burn bridges. I know there are some people who do, do things that are not great. Stress happens. People are individuals. There's a lot of things that can happen, but not burning those bridges. Um, it's okay to tell someone like, I didn't really agree with this thing that you did and I am moving forward away from this relationship, but really just being graceful and compassionate. I am so glad that I am not a bridge burner because it has actually worked in my favor in my life and the people who have wronged me have eventually apologized or recognized what they did. Um, so the universe has a way of taking care of those sort of situations. Um, but I'm just saying that because networks, that, that is how 90% of people get their jobs. It's through the networks and the people that they know. Um, and you don't have to be well off to do that. You just have to be a friendly person. Um, the other piece is like everyone was saying, really find those connections. What I've noticed is so many of the opportunities I get is from friends, um, friends who are part of the LGBTQ community as well. Um, we often take care of one another and I deeply appreciate that, like the care and compassion that we have in our community. And it shows up in the workplace. And so I've been so grateful for just the other queer folks that I've run into, the wisdom that I've seen from older folks who um, have been in this space longer um, during difficult times. And so, yeah, just embracing those spaces. I used to feel a little awkward and did not go to clubs that much either when I was in college. And I kind of regret that a little bit because there's so many queer people, so many cool queer people I went to college with that I wish I would have spent more time around. Um, but I was a little too nervous for it at the time. But definitely embrace those spaces. Don't burn the bridges and um, 
network, network, network. Um, and also, be it's okay if your path's a little windy, um, if you're not really sure what you're going to do. I was a AmeriCorps for a year um, doing academic coaching after school programs. I did community organizing with young people and policy work. Now I'm a therapist. And somehow, magically, all of those skill sets came together into the job I'm in now. And all of them apply to the job I'm in now. It's ridiculous. But it's okay if you don't know what you're doing. Like, it, we have our whole entire lives to figure it out. Thank you, Michaela. Those transferable skills are important. So, yes, <coughs> listen to what is being shared here, y'all. This is this yes. is some dope information. Anybody else want to join in on, on answering this question? I was just going to jump in. I, uh, Michaela hit on some key points, I think. You know, I, I was a history major, so I could avoid math, and I ended up at IBM for 20 years. I mean, never say never. <laughs> you don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know what skills you're going to need or how you apply them, but don't sell yourself short. You've got your toolkit. You can apply it across the board. You know, you've got your degree in hand. Don't sell yourself short. You can do anything. You can apply it anywhere and never say you're not going to end up somewhere. I mean, um, my undergrad was history. I went and did my student teaching for uh, social studies. Loved the kids. Didn't like the administration part of it or the parents part of it. Ouch. Um, so I went back got my master's, worked in sports information, went a whole different path, but be flexible. I mean, you like I say, you never know where you're going to end up, but you've got your core skills and you can apply them anywhere. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else before we uh, move on to our next question? All right. Um, so my next question, and I think we, we might have a little bit of time to open it up for some audience questions as well. Um, and I'm going to put this question in the chat too. Um, so thinking about your, um, well, maybe not your identities specifically, but how has um, your queerness or other identities been an asset? And I think some of you started to talk about this a little bit in your introductions, um, but we'd love to hear how, how you've used uh, queerness or any of your identities as, as assets or um, as sources of strength in your work. All right, so I'll cheat on this one. I can think of two jobs specifically I received because I was out. Um, in my career and, and community, it was both. Um, when I went to work for the Daniels Fund is when I was chair of the board of the Gay Lesbian Community Center. And then when I went to Gill, Gill because of that saw me as a gay black man at the time. And I, my portfolio was working with straight civil black civil rights organizations to get them engaged in GLBT civil rights. Um, I also handled a trans portfolio and an HIV AIDS portfolio. If I had not been out, um, there's no way that Gill would have spotted me. And that was a transformative career for me. Um, there was also, you recognize a difference when your passion becomes your profession. And honestly, when you are gay 24 seven, it was almost like it took some of the fun out um, because when I was finishing work and I went out with friends, they want to talk about gay civil rights. They want to talk about marriage equality. I want to talk about TV because I, I spent the last eight, nine hours talking about work and recognizing there is a difference between your passion and your, and your profession. And I needed a balance. I, I needed a balance. But I also saw the breadth of the experience. And I saw true allies who were doing their best to become allies. And we were sometimes the hardest on them when they weren't picking up the initials quick enough, when they weren't understanding the, the, the terminology. Um, and recognize if they're in a the room trying, it's at their pace as much as my pace to come out. And I had to recognize that my pace for being gay had to be very different than the people who were around me, no matter what. Also identifying I have younger people who just came right out. There was no period for them, and they were far more aggressive and open about it. Um, so I think for me, it's there was a, a chance with being openly out and gay. And I will say this, and I'll do a plug. Um, when I came back and got involved with the, uh, the Pride Center, uh, Blanche Hughes took me to lunch, and we started the game, and Dan was with us. We started the Gay and Lesbian Alumni Association. We had to put together our portfolio to take to the board, and we were all prepared for a long fight with the Board of Trustees we had every argument, we had all the statistics, we practiced it, it went through in one vote. And every time we come back for the pride uh, graduation, we say, please come back, please come back. Oh, we're gonna come back, we're gonna come back. 
and people disappear. I get it, you need some space, but someone on that campus still needs you. I'm, I'll be 60 this year. The difference between my experience and someone who just graduated five years ago, you have far more to offer than when you come back after five years than me coming back at 60. So don't forget folks still need you on that campus no more, no matter how progressive it is and how it's changed. And that's my frustration. I'm still president of the Gay Alumni Association for the last 12 years. I'm 60, please, somebody, somebody take this thing and put it and run it differently than me. So. Thank you for that. And yes, we are so grateful that you keep coming back, Morris. Please keep coming back for as long as you are living and breathing because we appreciate you and value you for sure. Other folks, other, other thoughts? Morris, it was really cool to hear you talk about how it impacted you when your identity was your work and what that was like, because that's very different from my experience in the tech field. I do not get to discuss queer policy or any of the sort in tech unless it's, you know, at the specific ERGs. But I tend to get that and those opportunities outside of work um, through volunteer work through organizations. I try to find my people and really reach out and stay involved because like you said, you're absolutely right. You don't know who else needs you out there, whether that is someone in college who needs you now, whether that is being out at work and then someone can come out to you and see you as a safe person. And yeah, just the presence that you have by being queer in any space is its own strength because you bring the community with you. Absolutely, thank you so much for that Arcus. I can go ahead and share. Um, I have a lot of thoughts, um, a lot of things that I'm thinking about, but in terms of it being an asset or a source of strength, um, similar to Morris, I did work actually at an LGBTQ org um, for a little bit called Lavender Rice Project that has the Washington Black Trans Task Force. And I just could not do that work really. Like I enjoyed working with the folks there, but I have come to realize that I cannot have that be my job 24 seven because it's also my life. So I, it's, I'm hearing this all day that I go home and I'm like sad because I'm hearing all these really sad stats about black non-binary people, which is me. Um, and so I can't make it be my only work. Um, but just through taking tests like strength finders and other things, I have realized that I am an advocate, always have been, that's just what I do. Um, I take it into every space with me. And so it has been my mission to realize that I am very lucky and very grateful to be able to have had access to the education I have had access to and the, the career opportunities I've had. And very few people from my community have access to those things. And so I'm very intentional about being out in my identity and speaking up on behalf um, of my community in spaces um, because we need, we, we need someone to remember that there are people out here who don't have these supports or people who um, are have these outcomes that are really sad when we look at we're looking at the stats, like specifically around Black trans people or Black trans femmes especially. Um, and so I make sure and I make it my business to always be that person. And it's hard. It, it's it. I'm not going to lie and say like, oh, this is the easiest thing, like to be this person who's the voice constantly reminding um, government or the mental health field that we exist and that we deserve to have good lives. But that is what I do. That is my passion. That's what I need to do. And so that is what I, that's what I intentionally make sure that I am always doing. Um, and I've had people who were in the closet um, who came up to me and talked to me and shared these, these stories with me and said they were grateful that I was in this space and that I was out in that way. And I'm so grateful that I chose to be out, that I am that I put myself, so to speak, on the line um, because I'd rather it be me than someone else who um, could be harmed um, like if I have to be that person who's speaking out, then I will do it. Um, and so, yeah, that's just the role that I've been in. And that's, that's what I do. Like, I will always speak up for my community. It's hard. Um, but it's been an asset. It's absolutely been rewarding. I think about how much it strengthens the people around me. And so, yeah. Thanks, Michaela. Um, in the beginning of starting our business, we had the choice, we had a discussion. Do we identify as a gay owned business? Do we put a rainbow flag on our on our business? Do we do we do it? And really early on, we made a decision that yes, we're gonna do it. That's who we are. 
And not a weekend goes by that a little kid will say, I like your rainbow flag when their parents walk away. So just for that kid that comes once a weekend and this, they're able to connect with somebody who they're looking at, so you know, you're, you're me and I'm you and I'm gonna say your rainbow flag is important to me. Um, it really makes a difference and it really makes us feel like it's what we wanted to do. And in that little bit made a difference in that kid's life in Texas in a not safe place where, you know, homeless youth is overwhelmingly LGBT um, to say, hey, I see you. And I thought, I think that's important. It's a, it's a source of strength for sure. Fantastic. Thank y'all so much for sharing those insights. We do have a question. Um, and I think the question, you know, we'll open it up for, for the entire group, but Morris is specifically addressed um, uh, in reflection to one of your comments that you made um, earlier, um, which reads, I'll read it out loud. It's, Morris, you mentioned the importance of stepping into the room, even if you're the only queer slash gender slash diverse slash out person in the space. How do you set and communicate boundaries about bringing your identity to work and that you're not there to speak for the entire queer community? Let me speak to the first, the second one first, because um, certainly it's the issue when you were a black student in the classroom, that was common. Um, and I think it's okay to say that. Um, my opinion, my experience, my lived experience is, and make a point of saying, this is not to say that all black people are, all gay people are. Um, I think that's perfectly, in fact, you do yourself a disjustice if you don't do that. Because um, you want them to recognize as a breadth of, of experiences. Um, so I say that whether it's because I identify as a black man, as a black Christian man, black gay man, whichever, I always off that's my career. And I recognize that it is tremendously different. My career path, no matter what I tell you, it can never be replicated. Um, so I don't want to give the false impression that because I did this and came out to someone, it's going to work that same way. Again, I think it, be strategic. Um, some degree, use common sense. Um, one of my downsides that my, my, one of my managers told me is sometime Morris in an issue, um, particularly when it came to things around social justice or civil rights, or you get so excited, you're not listening, you're just waiting to speak. And I realized I was so excited to talk about my experience. And she said, just write a number down, one, three, five, or five, and tell yourself I will be the third person to speak. And if what I was going to say is said before me, stop unless I have something new to offer. It made me be very conscious about what I was contributing as opposed to being the only person of color in the room or the only gay man in the room and thinking I had to say about everything about every issue, just being strategic about what I'm offering. So you don't overwhelm. And otherwise it becomes that person class from like, uh oh, there's more speaking again. Um, and it loses the power because they're just always expecting you to say something. Thank you so much. Would anybody else like to jump in and try and answer that question as well? Otherwise, um, we still have a little bit of time if we maybe have any other questions. Otherwise, we're, I'm going to hand it over to Alexis to kind of wrap up our time since we're, we're almost at five o'clock. Yeah, uh, thank thank you, Ashley. Yeah, if um I know there's quite a few people in the physical space. So if Kelsey or Maggie, um, if there's other students um that want to um ask questions, let me know. We're good on the okay, awesome. Um, well, thank you all um for the panelists for sharing. Like I mentioned earlier, like this is like part of our healing process. And I feel very like energized, at least for me, I feel very energized just listening to you all. And I hope that everyone else in the room, uh, virtually and physically, um, felt that as well. Um, just a few reminders. So um um, I, I'm Alexis, by the way, I work in the Career Center. And so I am one of those people to help you um, navigate um, things regarding career. And then Kelsey, who's in the physical room, um, is um, does so as well, specifically in the College of Liberal Arts. And so if you're in the College of Liberal Arts, please reach out to Kelsey. And then we have um, Jose Ars, who works in the College of Engineering. So if you're an engineering student, um, the three of us are um, open, um, openly queer and, um, are like student facing and take appointments. So we help with cover letters and resumes, um, but also job searches, internship searches, how to network, 
um, how to negotiate a salary um, <laughs> uh, some and like mock interviews. So a lot of people don't know that we do that. Also, you can use the Career Center up to a year for free after you graduate. And a lot of people don't know that, but please see us before you graduate because um, that is super helpful. Um, and then just a few more reminders. Tomorrow is a career fair called Just in Time, and it will be in the ballrooms in the LSC on the top floor. And there's about 99 employers um, wanting to speak to you all. So um, having these like questions about um, how do you support diverse um, folks um, in your space and your company, like those are really good questions to ask at a career fair. And then um, on Thursday in the Pride Resource Center, we have um, another alum, um, alum coming to take headshots. Um, so if you want to take headshots, yeah, headshots for any of your professional um, portfolios, et cetera, we, we got you. And then Kelsey and I will be there to answer um, questions um, in regards to the Career Center and our resources, et cetera. Let me check the chat. Uh, Maggie put in um, full details in the online chat. And then um, those of you who are in person, we have like copies of, of the event or you can look at our Instagram. And then lastly, uh, Maggie create, because of this panel that we've done for a few years now, uh, Maggie created a pride, um, pride's guide to employment. So talking about um, some of these questions, like how to disclose um, certain things, how do you navigate certain conversations, how do you negotiate, um, it's all in this um, Pride's resource guide here, and then we have physical copies in the room, and then we'll have um, also some in our center as well as the um, Pride Resource Center. And then um, we can, if the panelists are open, um, if there are students that want to talk to you directly more about your field and more about your experience, uh, let me know and then we can pass that information out to students. But again, I um, really want to thank you all for taking the time um, and panelists and interpreters um, for being here today um, means a lot. And I just want to thank you all, Alexis and the Career Center, as well as our lovely panelists for hosting um, and engaging in such a meaningful event. On behalf of the Pride Resource Center, we're, we're so honored um, and grateful for the opportunity to connect with so many amazing folks um, through this platform. Um, and we look forward to, to more folks coming to connect with us in the Pride Resource Center, um, as well as our friends and alums coming back to connect with us um, here on campus as well. So thank you so much. We appreciate the time. Um, and yeah, have a great evening, everyone. Great. Thank you so much. See you at Lavender Graduation. Thank you. Hey, y'all. I will send a follow-up email. <laughs>